Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Danny, and I'm with the learning team at Cherry Beckert. A few quick housekeeping items today before we get started. Uh, for audio during today's webinar, you may listen through the phone or the computer speakers. You can choose your audio under the audio tab in the menu to the right of your screen. To earn CPE for today's webinar, please make sure you answer all the polling questions. Make sure you click the submit button to submit your answers. Instructors will try to remind you of this as each poll appears. The instructors and I will answer questions in the question and answer pod. We will try to answer them throughout the webinar. So that's all for the housekeeping announcements and I'll turn it over to Mark. Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is Mark Cooter. I am Jerry Beckert's firm leader for real estate and construction. Welcome to uh, 2020 year-end tax planning and real, for real estate and construction companies. Uh, this is our fourth webinar of a four-series webinar for this week. Uh, this week will be recorded and available at stateage.com, and you will receive an email with information on how to access that uh, uh, after, the, uh, after the webinar. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us. This is part of uh, our industry. Um, continuing education series and where we're trying to provide information that is industry specific uh, related to the real estate and construction practice. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jason and Jason who are going to kick it off and get us started on this uh, this webinar. Thank you. Yeah, good morning everyone. Thank you again for, for joining us uh, for our 2020 year in tax planning and real estate construction. Uh, my name is Jason Hoard. I'm a tax partner out of the Nashville office. I'm on our uh, real estate executive committee, and I'm also on the Opportunity Zone uh, task force. So Jason Hall, Jason Hall, and I will be uh, presenting today. So there's our information. Should you have any questions following the presentation, please feel free to uh, reach out to us. The handout should be in the handout pod, and I think as Mark mentioned, this will be. Um, we are recording this session, so um, you can. Uh, be able to reach that on our on our website as well. So to say that, I will um, turn it over to Jason and I'll be back on shortly. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jason Hall. Again, I know it's confusing, two Jasons, two H last names, but hopefully it's a memorable thing for everyone. <clears throat> uh, I, am, I am a tax partner in the Durham office uh, for Cherry Beckert, and uh, I've been in real estate just about my whole life, uh, tax life. Uh, so, and I absolutely love tax planning. Uh, you'll hear me focus in on a few, hopefully, new tax planning ideas that you haven't heard of, uh, and and some that you probably have heard of. Uh, so, uh, definitely uh, glad to be here. Uh, let us know. I think one thing I I don't want to to uh discourage questions if you have any questions you can type them out we may or may not get to them in, during this presentation but uh we definitely will reach back out to you offline and uh and get those answers to you if you have them so please uh, i encourage questions and uh i think we will we'll get going uh this is our disclaimer uh hopefully you read it this weekend because it's it's exciting stuff but i won't read it to you now i think people go to sleep when people read slides to them so uh we'll keep going uh today's agenda today's agenda is uh where we try to put things into a few uh buckets so to speak so that we can uh keep it simple uh and try not to to feel like there's too much going on and one thing I, I, I really uh, love is, is reducing taxable income, uh, helping clients reduce their taxable income. Uh, what most people don't understand is that, that uh, there, there's opposites pulling at them. One wants their books to be very strong for bank purposes, uh, and the other one is to have taxable income low so that they don't pay a lot of tax. So, and then we're gonna talk about some revenue generators, uh, during these times, they're they're tough times, and so there may be a few people out there that are like, "Hey, how can I increase revenue uh, and and get some cash into my pocket?" We're going to also talk about 
a few special deductions and credits and deferrals, uh, just kind of along those same lines as one and two, uh, just to help reduce taxable income and maybe generate revenue. Uh, and then a few other kind of, I won't say boring, but some other tax planning ideas that you've probably heard of before, but are just solid. And we, we want to uh, make you aware of them uh, as well. Uh, so let's get into the first, the first section that we have is reducing taxable income. Uh, we definitely want to help our clients wherever we can uh, to, to do this. And very respectfully uh, within the law, uh, these things. And so <clears throat> hopefully uh, no one on this on this webinar is shocked by the word CARES, uh, the CARES Act. Um, that's what we're going to kind of talk about first because it's new. It's, it's new and while it's exciting in some ways, it's a headache in others. Um, there are there are four things we really wanted to touch on related to the CARES Act, uh, <clears throat> and that was legislation that came out to help with the uh, coronavirus, right? To give businesses a little bit of breathing room and and to to try to relieve some of the, the loss of revenue in businesses. Uh, so. You know, there was a there. There's two big pictures to kind of think about. One, Donald Trump came out with Trump's tax law changes back in 2017. That was a big deal in in the tax world, and 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 they pushed it through relatively fast. And one thing they didn't do is is include qualified improvement property uh, and make that eligible for bonus depreciation. So. Uh, the CARES Act fixed that. Now, I, I have to be careful and say, if you're a tax preparer or, or you as a, as a tax preparer <clears throat> didn't catch that and you, and you, you went ahead and bonused it, well, that, that's, uh, that, that wasn't the, the law back then, but, but uh, now it is. Now we're able to go back and fix that. That's a, that's a good thing. Uh, another thing, and we're gonna there, each of these slides, we're gonna talk a little bit about NOLs uh, because NOL carrybacks have been known to be very uh, monetarily good for my clients and good for you, uh, hopefully, if you are in an NOL position. Uh, there is a temporary increase of interest expense limits that that we'll touch on. And again, a temporary removal of excess business loss uh, limitation because we want to generate losses and then we actually want to be able to use them. So gratefully, the CARES Act came out and has kind of opened the door to help us uh, do, some, do some good tax planning. So uh, <laughs> we're going to warm you up. Like These are kind of to get credit for attending today. Um, these polling questions uh, are here sort of to, to just kind of keep you awake and to, and to help you get credit for today. So um, what, does, what does CARES stand for? Uh, definitely you, you, you can choose between the, the following choices, coronavirus aid, relief, economic security, uh, someone who cares strongly about real estate and or the coalition for auto repair equalities and or all of the above now hopefully you guys will be able to choose the polling question or the polling answers And I, I think most people chose A, which that is what CARES stands for, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Securities Act, Economic Security Act. But I will say that D is also a very solid answer, people, because the Coalition for Auto Repair Equality does exist. 
in this world. Uh, we will move on. Uh, so I'll back up just a quick. We're going to talk about these four things a little bit more in detail, and hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll get to uh, a good good spot in understanding what the uh, opportunities are here. So the first one was qualified improvement property. Again, uh, back in the olden days, we were used to hearing things like qualified restaurant property and qualified le leasehold improvement property and and being able to uh, bucket those or or treat those differently than just a 39 year uh, depreciable building. And so it used to be beneficial, but with Trump's tax law changes, uh, they they excluded it. Now they're including it, and it is eligible for bonus depreciation. That is an important thing. Uh, they through the CARES Act, they made it able for you to go back, and if you had correctly depreciated your qualified improvement property as 39 year or 27 and a half year, now you're able to go back and retroactively into 18 and 19. And fix that, and get the uh, and get the bonus depreciation on it, and that that's very beneficial. I would highly recommend uh, looking into that at some point. Now, this this is kind of linked to another idea uh, as well, so we're gonna we'll talk about that. But I, the left side, you know, it includes different types of 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 TIs, mostly, you know, is what we're we're talking about here. But there are there are some other things that are included in that bucket that you'll want to make sure you're treating correctly. Uh, NOL carrybacks was the second thing under the CARES Act we wanted to talk about. Uh, I will tell you guys by personal experience. Uh, recently, as of a week ago, we went through uh, filling out Form 1139. That's a C C Corp. Um, you know, tentative refund form, and it was absolutely painful. It was in the IRS instructions. It says it'll take you 27 hours just to get the paperwork together to to do this thing. It was it was it was a massive project because when you go back in time, and this all depends on what type of entity you are. You know, of course, if you're a partnership and or uh, an S corp, you wouldn't have some of these headaches, but uh, you would at the individual level uh, anyway. Uh, the things that, the things you want to think about in the NOL world are, you know, it impacts AMT. If you were paying AMT before, this could generate an AMT credit that can be monetized. Uh, it it impacts R and D credits. So if I'm carrying back a loss, if my 2019 tax return had a big old loss, I can now carry it back five years, five years, and and see if I had paid tax back then. And if I had AMT, if I had R and D credits, if I had uh, if I had D pad, it impacts all of those things. And and really and truly can generate cash refunds and also release credits uh, that you can use in a future year. It's it's a very good thing for taxpayers to to be able to do. So please look into it. Please talk to us about it because it's not easy, but it's it's very it's very helpful to the business. Um, oh, you have till. December 31st to fax these in to get uh, to get it quickly done. So that that is an important thing to to know as well. Uh, we wanted to kind of talk about 163J for just a few minutes. I mean, I think everybody kind of has selected a road. The real estate industry, uh, for the most part, everybody jumped on the train of I'm a real estate. Uh, I'm going to take the real estate exemption, 
and I am not going to limit my interest expense. That that is generally what I've seen, and especially like the the big funds and the other things. They kind of wanted to keep it simple, but but really and truly, you guys, it, it's it's important to understand the implications of that because you would need to compare um, the interest expense limits, uh, the, the benefit of not being limited on interest expense to the benefit of being able to uh, cost segregate your buildings or speed up depreciation on your buildings. And, and so we, we, wanna, we wanted to bring it up. We know that it, it's been the, the uh, the limitation on interest expense has been expanded. And so it's now 50% of your adjusted taxable income, um, or you can elect 30%. Uh, and, and so, and so the, the limit went up. So you, so that's a good thing, but you still, I would highly encourage, this is kind of a pay attention moment. If you're, if you're paying attention, hopefully you will to compare the benefit between, uh, your interest expense limitations and uh, whether or not you can speed up depreciation on on some of your assets. Um, we're going to talk about cost segregation a little bit later, uh, but that's that's kind of what we wanted to bring up here. Uh, the excess business loss limit was removed, so this goes right along with what we've been saying: is like if we can generate NOLs in 18, 19, or 20 the tax years, then they've removed the losses uh, or the loss limitation. There was an overall $250,000 for singles and $500,000 for a married filing joint return um, to offset non-business income. Those have been lifted. So uh, again, this slide is, 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 you know, 18, 19, and 20 are the years they're talking about. Um, so Definitely wanted to bring that up as well. Uh, so, so again, in this big bucket of, of creating losses and deductions and, and trying to reduce taxable income, we, we, won't, we want to highly recommend that all of our real estate clients and our construction clients look at the balance sheet. Um, scrub the balance sheet. Uh, we have found, I have found personally, like some of my clients have sitting on their balance sheets, a, a dead deal costs. Uh, these are these are costs that, these are projects that, that they wanted to get started. So they've dumped some, some costs into them, expecting to get reimbursed, but they never have been reimbursed. And so they've walked away from these projects and they still have those sitting on the balance sheet and so definitely please look at those dead deal costs and see if you can't uh clean up your balance sheet right there another great idea and you know some some clients may think of it some don't but uh, who is owning the tenant improvements uh in in your deals uh, we see a fair amount of of Big investor comes in and little developer comes in and and they they start a joint venture, a JV. And and so and so through that, usually the big investor wants as much deduction as possible. But there are opportunities for your management entity to own some tenant improvements, especially if you're in the building with like some of my clients are for you to own some of the tenant improvements so that against your development fees you can uh, you can depreciate some tenant improvement assets uh, definitely one if you have questions come talk to us about it and the last one is is just plain old asset recovery which is one of my favorite uh, definitely one of my favorite uh, things to focus on uh, is the cost recovery side. Uh, 
really quick, the picture on the slide, this is the first office building I ever worked in, in downtown San Francisco. And if you look super close in the window, you can maybe see me crying, either because I was working so hard or there was an earthquake and I was on the 21st floor. You decide. But buildings are great the generators of, of deductions. Um, hopefully, if you're in the real estate world, you've heard the term uh, cost segregation. I, I still am, am amazed at that about how many people, and, and depends on who you're using for your tax work, but the general easiest thing in your world to do is to just have an asset on your books that says building, building, and that's depreciated over 39 years. That's painful. So cost segregation breaks things down into individual assets of the building, into fixtures and and wood and flooring and piping and electrical electrical stuff. Any, all those things can be broken down and treated differently. Oh, sorry. 100% uh, bonus depreciation on some of those things that you can break out. 179 is still a thing. Uh, and again, we talked about QIP, Qualified Improvement Property. Jason, if I could interject right now regarding yeah. the cost segregation studies our our team can scope those at no ch no charge so if anyone has a, a building that they think uh, could be beneficial it doesn't cost you anything for us to scope you and, and show you the the benefit the cost benefit of doing those studies so so definitely keep that in that in mind yeah no i love that in fact i mean we we do that all the time for for clients and targets and a lot of times people think oh my building's older can i still do it it's got mixed use it's residential and non-residential can i still do it it's a bunch of townhomes like 10 million dollars worth of townhomes can i do it yes 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 please come talk to us about it because it's it's right there and it's some most of the time low-hanging fruit for a project that you're going to hold on to uh, for sure this is just you know pay attention to different things you can deduct things that you know assets you've gotten rid of um, and materials and supplies all those things that you can that are on your balance sheet as assets but you either don't have them or you've used them up or you can you can depreciate them. It has way too many words, so I just am not going to say anything other than sometimes you know you're paying too much in property tax and income tax, and you could you could again clean up your balance sheet, get assets off the books that don't belong there, and uh, and especially if your intention is to completely walk away from it and never use it again and and throw it in the garbage so that including um, my client that has 150 year old uh, oil filters on the on the wall that just are never going to be used anyway <clears throat> the minimum expensing that that's a thing that was a that was a bigger thing back with the repair regs and uh several years ago but it's still a thing and and uh if you if you think well you know i buy a lot of little things and uh i'm i am capitalizing i am putting onto my balance sheet all these little things and there are sometimes opportunities to not put them on your balance sheet, to actually just deduct them. And the, the proper way to do it is through uh, this de minimis expensing where you actually get uh, on your books um, or actually get in your business uh, a policy for uh, doing these ex this expensing. Uh, so definitely that's important. Oh, I almost... So, so the next slide, you guys, this is a pay attention slide. I love this slide, the next one, because uh, I think most people, I would, if, if I was a betting person, which I'm not, I would think most people have not heard of, of 
of the next slide, which is VIP. Uh, so if your business, real estate clients oftentimes are strapped for cash and they want to put every cent back into their, their projects and try to, to do it that way. That is a true statement. Some of my clients, and I've had some extremely large developer clients, have no retirement benefits at all. You know, they, they pay out bonuses to their people, but even for themselves, uh, they, don't, they don't think down that road. I think of deductions for your company and your management company that's receiving development fees uh, and construction fees as we want to generate deductions. And VIP is, is you can look at it as, an, as a supercharged uh, retirement plan where it allows you to put in a lot more money into a retirement plan than a general 401k and profit sharing scenario. Definitely, it depends on your age and the compensation, and there's a bunch of little hoops to jump through, but definitely I have seen clients able to put away hundreds of thousands of dollars per year into retirement, and it's a deduction for the company. You've got, you've got to love that, and it's, and, and it's not the standard, and your employees will love you to death because they have to take part in it a little bit. But generally speaking, the benefit far outweighs the cost of doing it. It didn't used to be that way, but but nowadays uh, it, it is. The, co the cost of doing it is far outweighed by the, the benefit. So definitely talk talk to somebody about that. I, I There are cash balance plans out there. That's what most banks talk about. But you don't want those because there's an underfunding risk. You don't want underfunding risk at the end of the year. You want, want to go down a different path and VIP has no underfunding risk. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. I'm a fan of VIP, I am. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good tool. And, and my real estate clients, some of them think in their head, well, yeah, Jason, that locks up money that I can't use for the next deal, but so does paying the IRS because you're not getting it back most of the time. So it, it's it's kind of a weight a weight thing. You want to weigh the options and weigh uh, what you're what you're doing. So definitely uh, please uh, talk to somebody about that. We have this one page super easy um, little blurb that talks about it. Now is our polling question. Polling question number two. This is an important one too. D is always a solid answer too. Uh, what is VIP? Very important president, variable investment plan, very into paperwork. That's me. Just kidding, and not sure. Everybody seems to have gotten it right, except 2%, but that's okay, that's okay. If you're very into paperwork, I'm okay with that. I am okay with that. All right, we're gonna keep going. Hopefully we're not going too fast or too slow, but we just want to bring up as many things as we can to make this beneficial for you guys. Write something down, get something on paper, and then and then talk to somebody about it. The next kind of section uh, deals kind of with with revenue generators. And when I say generators, may not be what you're thinking of because generally speaking, we don't want more taxable income. Generally speaking, but with all of the political changes being made and with some other things that dealt with the CARES Act and coronavirus relief, we want to think down these lines also. So I think Jason Hoard is gonna take it over from here for a few slides. Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, just wanted to bring up 
uh, PPP, I'm sure everybody on the webinar has, everybody's heard those three letters this year and may even, um, I'm sure a lot of you have filed for PPP loan and now are starting to work on your, um, getting your forgiveness applications. Um, Cherry Buckert's uh, well-suited to help you have a dedicated team um, regarding PPP. You can see a lot of uh, material and everything on our on our website. Um, the kind of the hot button right now with PPP is what are we going to do with the expenses that have been paid with the PPP loan proceeds? Well, early, earlier this year, the IRS issued a notice, notice 2020-32, that generally said that no deduction is going to be allowed for expenses paid by your PPP loan proceeds when that PPP loan is, is then forgiven. Well, they've recently come out with some updates to kind of expand that and, and give a little more guidance. Revenue ruling 2020-27 basically has come out to say that if you have completed your application or not, and at the end of the tax year, you reasonably expect your loan to be forgiven, then those expenses paid for with the PPP loan proceeds are not going to be deductible. So it took the timing of the filing and completing the application kind of out of the equation. They did also offer a safe harbor under Revenue Procedure 2020-51 that has said that, um, that you can claim the expenses paid with the PPP if at the end of the prior tax year, you reasonably expected your loan to be forgiven. And then in a year after that, in a post year, your loan was actually, the forgiveness was actually denied, or you decided not to request that forgiveness. In that instance, you can go back on your 2020 return, either amend your 2020 return, or if you're still under your filing and extension period, you can then include those expenses um, on your return to the extent your loan was not forgiven. But in order to do that, you've got to file it under a safe harbor, so you have to attach an applicable statement uh, to your originally filed return indicating you're filing under the safe harbor. So those are the two most recent updates we've got on PPP. Um, not sure if we're going to get any more guidance, but that, that's where things um, currently stand with the, with the PPP. Jason, I think everybody's, everybody's hoping it's, it's going to go the other direction, but the IRS is not that kind. I know that's a <laughs> for most people, but they 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 uh, have kind of dug their heels in a bit. Now, will new legislation come out? We're we're all waiting to see, right? Uh, and that that's it for PPP. So uh, let us know if you have questions or or anything about PPP because it sometimes gets daunting and confusing, and we've got people that deal with it all day long. Um, wanted to talk briefly about carried interest and you know the the carried interest rules are are important uh in the partnership and the s corp world if you're involved in deals where you're a developer and you've got a small piece of of the the jv entity uh, you want to you want to make sure that you're you're taxed at the right time and at the right rate uh so there, there is a big deal about about profits, interest, and whether they should be, and and it comes up every every year, just about it seems like where someone tries to say no, that's that's ordinary income, not long term capital gains. So they kind of clarified and said, you know, you need to hold those interests, those partnership interests, for three years uh, in order to get preferential capital gain treatment. Uh, I wanted to kind of go a step further. That's kind of a basic rule. Um, uh, you know, you, you want to you want to really understand your partnership agreements and your uh, development agreements. And you want to be very careful of, of crediting capital accounts for work you're doing and your position in a distribution in the distribution language of your partnership agreement just be careful and have somebody look at your partnership agreements and your uh and your development agreements so that you're not 
accidentally triggering taxable income where you don't need to, and especially at ordinary. Uh, we we have clients that we do work for that we plan for those things and we help you know uh, draft partnership agreements that are are beneficial in that way. Uh, deferred development fees, things like that. Those are the things that we want to watch out for and make sure they're being treated and, and properly done for tax purposes. Uh, this is another slide right here, you guys, uh, that just like VIP, don't know how many of you uh, know about these things. Some, of, some people do. One of my clients very well knows about it. Um, this is a revenue generator. Again, this is a, a call renters insurance captives. Captive insurance is, is a, a type of self-insurance. Most lessors uh, require renters insurance for their properties, on their properties. That renters insurance money generally goes to some ins big insurance company. Why not have that coming to you instead? like instead of instead of that and so and so you set up your your own renters insurance captive and it's established by the owners it's owned by the owners it's an additional revenue stream uh and, and the, the the magical thing there is tax magic in in this in that <clears throat> the first 2.2 million dollars if it's set up correctly is not taxable to the insurance company so so guys just if you think about that it, it, it is a pot of of dollars that can grow uh sometimes tax-free please like consider it as we we know that it can be a good thing and yeah there might be some claims from time to time on it but that's what it's there for and you would try to use this um, and possibly use it with uh, other insurance as well. So make sure you're fully covered, but that you're, you're able to possibly generate some income and be able to choose when that income is then taxable to you. Uh, I think Jason's gonna talk a little bit about real estate professionals because it's still an important idea, guys. I, I, I love this idea. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Jason. Yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody of the real estate professional designation. And I'm sure there are numerous of you on the on this webinar that, that already are real estate professionals and, and um, file under that designation on your tax return. A couple of the big benefits is when you're a real estate professional, all your real estate activities are treated as non-passive because generally rental real estate income is considered passive and if your passive losses are in excess of your passive income those passive losses cannot be taken they can be carried forward but they can't be taken until you've got other passive income so when you're a rental real estate professional and you you actually have non-passive losses that are in excess of your income you get to take those deductions and then another benefit is that your income from your rental real estate activities is not subject to the net investment income tax. So that, that gets you out of that uh, 3.8 um, tax there. So how can I be or how, what do I need to do to be classified as a real estate professional? Well, you've got to materially participate in your real estate activities. And a couple of the main tests there is your real estate activities have to be at least one half of all the personal services that you provide during the year. And you also have to participate in that real estate activity 750 hours. Now the IRS does offer an election that you can group all your real estate activities. So let's say you have five separate activities and you participate 200 hours in each of those activities. You can make this election, group those together, and that can get you your 750 hour requirement to be can considered a real estate professional. Um, so one of the kind of the reminders and the real estate professional designation, it's an annual, um, you know, examine that annually to see if you qualify. Um, and if you don't qualify, your income's gonna be, your passive income 
which may not be a bad thing if it's a year that you have some other passive losses and you need passive income to counteract those losses. Um, so if you don't qualify in a year, it, it may not be a bad thing depending on your, your current situation. Now the grouping election is generally permanent unless you have a major event such as either retiring or uh, changing professions. But just wanted to make sure everybody thinks about that real estate professional um, each year when working on your on your tax return. Every single year, absolutely. That's that's for sure. Uh, are we ready? Next slide. Uh, you know. <clears throat> We, we wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, health insurance premiums and HSAs and retirement plans, like all those things for small employers, they, they, are, they are ways that we can uh, help our employees and also at the same time help our, our bottom line and our taxable, our taxable position. So we definitely have to bring that up as well. Uh, definitely small employers, you got to pay attention to those definite, the definition of small employer when you're doing that. Uh, the next slide is, is one of my all time favorite slides because I love partnerships and S Corps and uh, 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 partnerships, especially for real estate. Uh, there, there are, if you think about it, three big hoops to jump through, circus hoops, so to speak. Uh, in order for you to take a loss coming out of a partnership. And we just want you to not forget those things because you can't just magically create a loss and take the whole loss because they, uh, the, gov they, the government is not that nice. Again, they want you to really prove that you're able to take these losses. And so they put a bunch of kind of safety measures or stop stop gaps in there to try to to make sure that you're able to take those losses uh, partnerships are all about economics guys so uh, if you're the lucky guy who gets in on a partnership that owns real estate but you put only a dollar in there odds are you're not getting the 10 million dollar depreciation deduction sorry but but that's a true statement and i have had clients who are very sad about that uh, so this slide, just want to remind everybody, basis, uh, if, if I was in a, my class uh, at Sherry Becker uh, teaching staff people, I would have a Burger King uh, crown, and instead of Burger King, it would say basis king, because basis is king or queen, I guess, depending on who you're talking to, always you need basis, and you always got to be at risk and passive activities like Jason just said are are important. Don't forget that when you're trying to generate NOLs and everything you're doing, basis is still an important concept to 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 keep. Um uh, I mean if the tax rates rise next year, uh you th there are a bunch of things you can do because generally speaking that's what we've heard. That's what I've heard, you know, if there's a Biden presidency in there and he, he wants to raise income taxes on, on a lot of people, including my, most of my clients. And so that's, that's okay. So you just want to make sure you print this slide deck out and keep this one handy uh, when you're talking to uh, people about, you know, what if tax rates rise, what can we do? Uh, if, if, they, if they rise next year, uh, if they don't rise next year, what do we do in 2020 uh, so that we have preserved the losses for 2021? That's the idea. Um, we can select when we do cost segregation studies. We can select um, electing out of bonus. We can accelerate revenue. We can collect bill. We can do all those things, you guys, to, to changing to a cruel method of accounting to bump up income into 2020 because we think it'll be better. Uh, you just want to always have uh, on your on your uh, mind that that you want the ability to to change income and change deductions from year to year. Um, not deducting your PPP loan expenses is, is a great example 
uh, of that. Uh, and with that, I think we're going to move to polling question number three. Make sure you're still awake. This has to do with basis and passive losses and stuff like that. This is the actual polling question. Yeah. And we'll give people just a minute to, to crank on that. Just remember the hoops, how many hoops are in a circus? Three is it a three ring circus? Not hoops, but rings. <laughs> That's old school. There's no more circus, you guys. I'm just saying. It's old, it's old, old news, I guess. All right. Uh, it looks like most of you answered true. That's true. There are three things. You got to look at basis. You got to look at at-risk rules, and you got to look at passive rules. So definitely, there's three items to look at, to think about whenever you're trying to generate losses in your flow-through partnership S-Corp in your entities. Um, basis is definitely a thing. So now we're moving on to uh, our third section. Uh, this one has some things that you've heard of probably before, but well, we've got to bring them up because there's still opportunity there uh, before the end of the year to get involved in them. And I think Jason uh, Horde is going to talk a little bit now about uh, opportunity zones. Yeah, one of I think the one of the greatest deferral programs that and most taxpayer friendly things that I've seen the IRS do is the qualified opportunity zones. I'm sure a lot of you have probably heard of them or maybe even be investing in them, but just wanted to kind of give a brief overview. It, it, you've got to start with a capital van, capital gain event. So you've got to have a capital gain event. You can defer that gain by reinvesting your gain proceeds into a qualified opportunity fund. That fund then will invest in qualified opportunity zone property, either construct a property or make improvements in the property for it to qualify as um, QOZP, Qualified Opportunity Zone Property. Um, so one thing that, a couple, a couple things that the CARES Act did that are beneficial this year is, initially the reinvestment period was 180 days to get your proceeds in um, into the fund. The CARES Act allowed you, uh, or allowed that period to extend for this entire year. So if you had a capital gain event earlier in the year, you still have time to reinvest those proceeds into a, a fund. So definitely something to think about if you've had a capital gain event. Um, also, the um, you've got additional time to make your improvements. Normally, it's 30 months. You've got to improve or construct a building or the property in 30 months. They basically waived the nine-month period, this COVID period, from April to December. So they pushed that out for another nine months. You've got an additional nine months. And then the working capital safe harbor originally was 62 months to get all your your working capital you know, into the business or into the property, um, they've given an additional 24 months if your opportunity zone happens to be in a federally declared disaster area. So that, that gives you extra time there. Uh, one thing to, that we want people to make sure they realize is that opportunity zones are not just for um, individuals. So on the next slide, we've numerous types of entities, individuals, C-Corps, regulated investment companies, REITs, partnerships, S-Corporation, trust and estate can all benefit and participate in the Qualified Opportunity Zone program. So as I mentioned, you've got to have a capital gain event. So as you can see there, the eligible gains, 1231 gains, capital gain from sales of stocks, bonds, business assets, collectibles, and of course, real estate. So that, that those are eligible gains. Short-term gains are eligible, but you've got to remember they maintain that character over the deferral period, um, which the deferral period runs up to until December 31st of 2026. That's the point when all these deferred gains become recognized. And you see there, there are a few ineligible gains, uh, 1245 recapture, um, sales-related party, parties, and then the 1256 contracts of the, the um, gains are eligible and the offsetting transactions are not. So um, we've got a great Opportunity Zone team. We'd love to chat with you about them if, if you think this has been a, would be a beneficial deferral for you. 
so <clears throat> we definitely always want to bring up uh, deductions and credits because this is low hanging fruit, you guys. Some of this stuff you've heard of, some of you, some of you have not. If you own buildings, you got to remember these things because they're really they're really beneficial. They can really generate money. And a lot of times the, the buildings and the real estate have already tried to qualify some kind of lead certification. You know, I, I'm already energy efficient. I want this stamp of approval. So uh, just wanted to talk through a few of those. There's a solar, solar tax credit. Um, you know, the, the federal and the states, some states do uh, give those incentives as well. 179 cap D. I love 179 cap D, and people forget about it all the time. But you, 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 you should know as a if you're doing great, if you're a, a real estate owner, the two greatest things you could do, right? And if you're wanting to plan tax wise, is to cost segregate your building, and then whatever's left over, you 179 D like out of the 39 year bucket it's amazingly uh beneficial and and we've you, you've got to think along those lines and have those discussions uh 45l is a great credit um that's that's for like our mixed use properties where you know you've got a lot of residential uh home credit stuff going on that is a great credit to to try to get and again new markets tax credits that's you know that's a little more in depth, right? You get and and the government gives these uh, community development entities, they call them CDEs, uh, tax credits that you can invest your money in in one of these things and get tax credits. It's almost like you're buying tax credits, but it, it's it's a it's a thing and it's out there. And if you're taxable, you should look into it because it and and. And it's not that difficult of a concept, really. And again, always historic rehabilitation credits are pretty profitable uh, as far as helping to shelter uh, taxable income. Uh, that that's a uh, that's for sure. Um, another slide we wanted to bring up is deferring income. I mean, you definitely this is kind of more just your uh, operational things that you can do to to help with taxable income and that's you know you can you can do different I mean buildings uh electing installment sale treatment those are all good good ideas to kind of make sure and have those discussions if you're doing transactions uh this year in 2020 a lot of transactions are still getting pushed through in december uh, how is that thing structured and can we do it a better more efficient tax way Definitely, you want to think like that and think along those lines. Uh, then we've reached our last section, you guys. Uh, other tax planning kind of things, just kind of clean uh, as we wrap things up. Uh, good old 199A is still around for the short term, at least for 2020. Probably the most important thing. You know, if, if you're renegotiating leases or or you can change your lease stuff, you want to try to stay away from triple net leases because it's just easier to qualify for 199A if you're not in a triple net lease situation. So that's something you can tell your your uh, lessees and, and uh, try to help them out as well. So anyway, very important. Uh, you want to qualify for 199A if you can. Uh, I'm not going to go through the rest of those, but but it's a, it's an important idea. I love R&D tax credits for construction clients. If there's, if there's construction people on this call, please know. I almost got uh, thrown out. This was a while ago because it was an in-person meeting with uh, a group of construction management uh, people. Uh, CFOs and and uh, COOs and whatnot of construction companies, and I said, hey, you know, there is an opportunity to get R&D tax credits, and they laughed and they said, oh, I'm going to change my title, ha ha ha, you're so funny. It's real. It is a real thing. Depending upon 
your activities and your risk and what you do, uh, there may be a benefit there. So please don't think uh, inside uh, the box, think outside the box, so to speak, when you're thinking of things to help you with your taxable situation. R&D tax credits are great. And if you if you qualify for them, uh, some of the things you think about are, are exploring new methods of construction and, and uh, development, innovative, and developing different types of, of methods. Um, and there's got and there's got to be risk involved. There, there are some hoops to jump through again, but uh, an important one for sure. Uh, this is probably uh, v, VIP and captives are great. I love them. This one, I absolutely love the idea of changing your accounting method. When you start your entity, most of the time, people just check boxes and you go through that and you live your life and you don't think, ah, maybe I could change that. And I could, I could change my life dramatically. I will tell you that if you, if your average gross receipts are less than 26 million a year, you've got to look at changing accounting methods. Uh, and, and if there's opportunity there, cause it is low, low, low hanging fruit uh, i'm talking about how you report your revenue to the irs i'm talking about do you have inventory and can you change what you're doing around inventory and i'm talking about uh, percent complete versus completed contract all those things you can change those things and they are beneficial some a lot of times they provide a pop meaning a deduction in a given year when you make that change and and we highly recommend looking into those things uh just i'll touch on this for like 30 seconds uh, of course if there's disaster losses you know uh the, the pandemic is a disaster and so i'll, I'll leave you with two thoughts one is um if there is a real disaster, meaning your building has damage or your real estate is damaged, of course, there's ways to, to uh, harvest those losses. And the last bullet here I will mention is, is if you feel like your, your property value has dropped uh, from the pandemic below your original cost basis, talk to somebody about it uh that's all i'm gonna say there uh, i think we're almost out of time and i think we're almost to the end uh the last polling question you guys if you have energy to push the button uh go for it push the button uh, construction company activities always never may not sure qualify for r d tax credits I'll give you a hint. The answer most of the time in in tax land and in public accounting is it depends. So that <laughs> choice there, but there's one kind of like it. Anyway, I think I think most people have uh, weighed in there. Uh, please. Let us know if you have questions. My email is there. Jason's email is there. You can call us. We can do however you want to do it. Uh, we would love to to answer your questions. I I am I am very glad I've had this opportunity to talk to you guys. Wish I could see your faces, uh, but uh, definitely uh, definitely thank you for your time, and I look forward to talking to you. Yeah, I really appreciate everybody's participation and uh, joining us on the webinar. If you have questions, if you call and just ask for a Jason, you'll probably get one of us, and then we'll be happy to happy to help you and and uh, look forward to talking to you soon.